today on Spiritual Awakening Radio, Veganism, Vegetarianism, and The Path of the Masters, a Satsang edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio, featuring readings from Sawan Singh, Kirpal Singh, Swami Sant Seviji, mostly focused on the teachings of the enlightened masters, about vegetarianism, veganism, and the spiritual reasons pertaining to meditation and karma, why some adhere to a vegetarian diet and path of non-violence. My name is James Bean. My website is spiritualawakeningradio.com. At my website is a donate button. There are links to Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. Social media where you'll find daily spiritual quotes. There are links to podcasts available for free on demand. Links to my newsletter at Yahoo Groups, WordPress, and Blogger. All at my website, spiritualawakeningradio.com. To get in touch with me for any reason whatsoever, perhaps to request a copy of my article on vegetarianism and the great world religions, or any other quote you may hear on today's program, you can request copies of things by sending me an email at this address, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. James at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Before I get into the path of the masters and vegetarianism, as well as veganism. A few loose ends from past shows. This is program number four today in this series. You can check out the previous podcasts on the vegetarian diet. Those are available now online. So, a few loose ends, some comments before I move on to the path of the masters. Shoghi Effendi of the Baha'i Faith, from the book Lights of Guidance, once said, It is certain if a man can live on a purely vegetarian diet and thus avoid killing animals, it would be much preferable. Abdul Baha of the Baha'i Faith also said, Fruits and grains will be the foods of the future. The time will come when meat will no longer be eaten. Medical science is only in its infancy, and yet it has shown that our natural diet is that which grows out of the ground." Unquote. A passage from the book Baha'u'llah and the New Era. Not only in the Baha'i faith, but in the Hebrew scriptures of Judaism and Christianity, there are prophecies about a peaceful, more enlightened humanity, and that includes a humanity that's vegetarian. But those on a serious spiritual path that believe in a present tense kingdom of God want to enter into that golden age personally right now. If not now, when? This is the life we have, and we can choose to follow the highest path. We don't need to wait for prophecies to be fulfilled hundreds of years from now. We don't have to put off the spiritual life till after death, or off in some hypothetical future. We don't have to be content with stories about how things once were in the Garden of Eden. We don't have to put off or postpone the spiritual life. Typically, those who believe in a present tense kingdom of God are vegetarians. And there have always been mystical movements like the Nazarite vow and Sethianosis, the Essenes, the Ebionites and the Nazareans, the early Christians. Gnostics, Manichaeans, Cathars. Throughout the ages, those who have believed in a present tense kingdom of God, seeking to enter into it right now, have been vegetarians. There once was a veg pharaoh in Egypt long ago. Akhenaten was his name, the heretic pharaoh was pacifist, vegetarian, and banned animal sacrifice and traditional polytheistic Egyptian religion in the temples of Egypt, and replaced it with a philosophy based on compassion and monotheism, or a kind of proto-monotheism at least, believing in one deity, one god. 
Akhenaten was an important figure for humanity, laying the groundwork for a more enlightened future. Initiates, serious spiritual seekers, however, have already begun their own personal golden age. For them, the prophecies are fulfilled right now. Perhaps one of these days the wider population of humanity will embrace the wisdom proposed by the Pharaoh from 1334 BCE. Perhaps the human race will catch up to Pythagoras, who also lived during BC times, and Lord Mahavira, and other figures of the past. But those on a spiritual path can choose to have their own golden age, here and now, during this life. For them, they're already entering into that enlightened future of humanity. We as individuals are free to choose. Some other loose ends. St. Paul. Let's sign up St. Paul to the vegetarian movement. I've had some new thinking about Paul. Paul, of course, was in a very vicious argument with the followers of the Jesus movement over the issue of diet and new converts. But I've changed my thinking a, a little bit because successors of Paul and fans of Paul in early Christianity who were vegetarians really liked Paul. Why is that? How could he have been anti-veg? and their great enemy on the issue of diet. And yet, they liked him. He was in this dispute with the Jesus movement, yes, and it included about vegetarianism, yes, but I think, in reality, it had more to do with how Paul was organizing his movement. And the Jesus movement and Paul didn't see eye to eye on that point. But it wasn't a simplistic Paul pro-meat versus vegetarian followers of the Jesus movement, including the disciples. Not exactly. What I think was going on there was Paul was organizing his spiritual movement like a mystery school with an outer court or outer circle of new believers, newbie converts that are developing faith, and he had an inner circle of initiates, those being perfected in the faith and becoming more mature. For them, vegetarianism was a requirement and came up as they applied for initiation into, quote, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, unquote. So I think Paul's conflict with the Jesus movement was over how things are done, not simply a pro versus anti meat stance. For the Jesus movement, there's only one circle. There's no inner circle or outer circle, there's just the circle of disciples. But Paul, having a school of mystery, a mystery school format in mind, had a kind of two tiered process. New converts can follow any diet. And they're newbies just learning about the faith, but the inner circle does become vegetarian. And that's why those who claim succession, apostolic succession from Paul, who were vegetarian, like Paul. They don't consider Paul an enemy, a pro meat apostate, rather, they see him as a great saint. Hieronymus was an early church father and recognized by Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And yet he says this, the consumption of animal flesh was unknown up until the Great Flood, but since the Great Flood we have had animal flesh stuffed into our mouths. Jesus the Christ, who appeared when the time was fulfilled, again joined the end to the beginning, so that we are now no longer allowed to eat animal flesh, unquote. Early church father, pro-veg church father, Hieronymus. The Valentinians who claimed direct succession, there was a kind of apostolic succession from Paul to Valentinus of Alexandria, they were vegetarians and they liked Paul. 
Why is that if Paul is uh, the pro-meat apostle in an argument with the early uh, disciples of Jesus on the subject of diet? I think the inner circle, outer circle, mystery school format of Paul helps us make sense of the situation going on in early Christianity. So Paul was a vegetarian. He did not require vegetarianism for new converts, but did require vegetarianism for those entering into gnosis, entering into the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the more serious inner circle of disciples being perfected in the faith. I think that's what was going on with Paul and how this makes sense of the history of that period. Saint-Mot, the path of the masters and vegetarianism as well as veganism. George Bernard Shaw once said, a man of spiritual intensity does not eat corpses. An amazing statement there. All past and present masters of Saint-Mot, most advanced saints of inner light and sound, advocate following a vegetarian diet. In fact, being vegetarian is a requirement in order to be initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Meditation practice upon inner light and sound. The soul's ability to see and hear within and explore inner space, the kingdom of God within you. Saint-Mot, the path of the masters, is a vegetarian path for mystical, spiritual, ethical, and theological reasons. The masters teach that foods are of three kinds, sattvic, rasic, and tamsic. The last category of foods, which includes all flesh foods, is to be completely avoided. Sattvic, or pure foods, the first category, includes beans, grains, vegetables, fruits, seeds, and nuts. Sattvic foods are considered by mystics to promote relaxation, meditation, and spiritual experience. And typically those mystical movements throughout history who believe in entering into a present tense kingdom of God and who work with the third eye center are about spiritual seeing and spiritual hearing. They tend to be vegetarian, as if there's something about eating meat that darkens one's inner vision. The bad karma and other negative effects of flesh eating seems to darken one's vision of inner light, interfering with concentration and meditation. It's interesting to notice that the sattvic diet of the path of the masters, as well as of Hinduism and the yoga philosophy of India, is also the life extension diet, the anti-cancer diet, the diet for antioxidants and getting as many plant-based nutrients as we can and is the diet of light and sound mystics, east and west. Master Kripal Singh once addressed this issue of diet and consciousness. Master Kripal Singh, speaking about Rumi and the other more advanced murshids or spiritual masters of Sufi mysticism, once said, those who take up the practices of the lower centers, concerning the lower centers in the body, do take meat. The Mohammedans and people of other religions also. But those who are anxious to rise above body consciousness and go into the beyond have of necessity to avoid all that. This is the path I have put before you liberation or salvation is something which starts only when you rise above body consciousness for this reason vegetarianism is the first essential a passage from Kirpal Singh's book The Night is a Jungle published by Ruhani Satsang and available for free online at the Ruhani Satsang USA website The Path of the Masters is all about working with subtle energies, opening up, becoming receptive to subtle lights and sounds. And this all is very important for those on the path of the Masters.
One cannot be in utter denial of cruelty, suffering, hellish torture and pain on the one hand, and yet are this aware, awake person developing receptivity to subtle heavenly lights and sounds. You can't really be doing both of those at the same time. One cannot be sensitive to the light of heaven, but insensitive and dull when it comes to cruelty and the suffering of other beings. Traditionally, Santmat and the yoga philosophy have advocated the lacto-vegetarian diet, abstinence from meat, flesh, fowl, and eggs, but allowed dairy. This has been the tradition for much of Indian history. Vegan means complete abstinence from all animal products and strictly adhering to a plant-based diet. So therefore no meat, but also no dairy, no eggs or meat of any kind or products made from animals like honey. If one doesn't want to eat the cow, one doesn't wear the cow either in the form of leather as in shoes or belts or other clothing. An ethical consistency there is to be found in veganism. Based on the current cruel practices of the dairy industry in India and around the world that violate the principle of ahimsa or non-violence, plus all of the scores of medical studies these days showing that dairy consumption adversely affects our health and well-being, causing more suffering in the world, I believe if they were here today, the classic saints of India, such as Lord Mahavira of Jainism, Guru Kabir, Guru Nanak, Sant Tukarama, Sant Ravidas, Tulsi Das, Nam Dev, Darya Sahib, Tulsi Sahib of Hathras, etc., would not only be advocating a vegetarian diet, but a vegan diet. These days, many are making this transition to vegan. No more dairy products, no animal products whatsoever, not just abstaining from meat, but abstaining from dairy, not even eating honey, and not wearing leather products either. No exploitation of animals whatsoever. Many are transitioning to vegan these days, including a growing percentage of those following the path of the masters. The path of the Masters is transitioning from a lacto-vegetarian diet to a purely sattvic, vegan diet. This is the compassionate direction that history is going in. This is the compassionate direction that the vegetarian movement is headed in. Vegetarianism itself is going vegan. For the medical human health aspects of veganism, see the research of Dr. T. Colin Campbell, author of The China Study, as well as Dr. Michael Greger, author of the book How Not to Die, and creator of the non-profit website nutritionfacts.org, presenting the research about the positive effects of plants and the adverse effects of not only meat, but dairy upon the human body. And I can say personally, I know of a few gurus in the Sant tradition that died of cardiovascular disease. They were vegetarians, but they consumed dairy products, which includes a certain amount of animal fat and cholesterol. I think the evidence is pouring in from the scientific community, from all of the med studies, I think there is a developing consensus that it's healthier to be vegan, it's more compassionate to be vegan, it's more ethical to be vegan. On today's program you'll hear about someone's visit to a dairy farm, revealing how the dairy cows end up at the same slaughterhouse as the meat cows, and it's all the same thing. In a sense, dairy products are even more ethically troubling because, well, the cows live a hellish life of being tortured for five years 
and then end up at the same slaughterhouse. Vegetarianism is becoming vegan. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening Radio. Today my focus is Vegetarianism, Veganism, and the Path of the Masters. After the break, teachings of Darshan Singh, Kripal Singh, Huzur Baba Sawan Singh, Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj, Lord Mahavira of Jainism, some information on the vegetarian philosophy and teachings of the Masters. Stay tuned for more Spiritual Awakening Radio after these messages. Vegetarianism, Veganism, and the Path of the Masters today on Spiritual Awakening Radio. The following verses of poetry are from the Urdu publication Path of Light by Darshan Singh. All living creatures seek to live in peace. With humaneness pass your days on this earth even the heart that beats in the breast of a beast has sympathy and love. So cast a look of loving compassion on all animals and bring a new dawn to humanity's night. A poem of Kripal Singh quoted in the book Portrait of Perfection. The whole creation is the temple of God there is no place where he is not. In minerals life is sleeping, in plants life is dreaming, in birds and animals life is awakening, and in man life is awake. As such we are brothers of all creatures, of plants, of birds and animals. So the flowers and trees, sparrows and doves, are as members of our own order. How simple, pure, loving, and beautiful they are. We should love all. We should live in fellowship with all creatures, with all life. One must not interfere with the life of any animal in God's creation. Hazur Baba Sawan Singh said, I must point out that animal food, even if a single particle is eaten, is detrimental to spiritual progress. He says, Sin, giving pain to the soul and mind, depends on the quantity of active tattvas, a Sanskrit word that basically means essence, principle, element, the divine, etheric, life force. The vegetables and fruits are recommended because they do not possess as much mind or possess it in a dormant state. The destroying of insects is a greater sin than destroying vegetables. Bird killing is worse than insect killing. Animal killing is worse than bird killing, while man killing is worst of all. There is karma even in vegetable eating, but not so heavy as in animal food. So there he explains the difference, why it is we, in having to eat something, choose vegetables and see that as more of an ethical, non-violent choice than animals. Hazur Baba Sawan Singh also said, about taking meat diet as directed by medical men, my advice is not to take it on any account. It is a great hindrance in our spiritual progress. We are governed by a very severe law of karma. To kill an animal is a heinous offense under natural law, and its punishment is very severe. 
The saints have strictly forbidden taking any sort of life in any way. I never gave permission to anyone to eat meat in my life. A mother does not administer poison to her own children. In Santmat, the path of the masters, animal food cannot be allowed under any conditions. It hardens the heart and makes the soul dull and heavy. Just a couple of comments. Um, you know, it does make the heart uh, make it does make the heart harden. The arteries harden too. <laughs> And the whole culture of denial around meat eating, you know, uh, is like uh, other forms of denial in human history. Slavery, what's the problem here? Torturing animals and killing them, what's the problem here? Lots of problems, actually, truth be told. So it's hard to, to be on a spiritual path where you notice the subtle wisdom the truth of the ages, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, about the journey of the soul and developing greater sensitivities to spiritual dimensions, spiritual hearing and spiritual seeing. One can't be opening up to receptivity on about these subtle levels on the one hand and yet being totally clueless in denial and unaware of these grievous problems on the outside. You know, it's hard to be both at the same time. It's hard to reach the more subtle states of tranquility in meditation on an animal flesh diet based on the suffering of other beings. And that's why vegetarianism keeps coming up in the East and in the West. For those following the path of the third eye center, spiritual seeing and hearing, the desire is to be vegetarian and peaceful following non-violence in thought, word, and deed. The following is on the reason why we in Santmat, the path of the masters, advocate following the vegetarian diet. It's by Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj from the book The Harmony of All Religions, published by Maharishi Mehi Ashram. The saints have addressed the sin of violence with their particular attention to the foods which are eaten, foods which are produced by killing living beings, as well as foods which are not pure and fresh, are considered tomsic. Consumption of these is prohibited by the teachings of the saints. This includes animal products such as meat, fish, and eggs. These foods inhibit the clarity of the mind and the health of the body. There is an old saying, whatever kind of food we take in, its properties will also fill our mind. A parallel saying is, whatever we eat, just so will our breath smell indicating the visible effect of food. Further, Guru Kabir said, the kind of food and drink which we consume directly influences how our mind will become. Even the quality of water which we drink will influence our speech. These words of Kabir Sahib are not merely rhetorical conjecture, but represent direct experience. Stay tuned for more Spiritual Awakening coming up. Vegetarianism, Veganism, and the Path of the Masters, today on Spiritual Awakening Radio. In his book, The Harmony of All Religions, Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj says, We must be disciplined in what we eat and drink, and by being disciplined, our wealth and spiritual path are protected. 
This world becomes agreeable, and so does the next world, since we won't be incurring the karmas from killing other living beings. Unquote. And that's true. It's better to have one's health than to be a millionaire without health. Health is everything. By avoiding the diseases we would get from consuming meat and dairy products, we get to live longer and avoid some suffering along the way. And if we're able to have a great meditation practice, that's something we can take with us into the beyond. The harshest words that Guru Kabir ever spoke were directed against the slaughter or consumption of innocent animals. Kabir once said, The man who eats meat is a demon in human form. Keep away from him. His company will ruin your meditation. That is a belief in the path of the masters that we are influenced by the company we keep on subtle levels. People will either be helping to open us up to the subtle realms of inner space, or they will be pulling us back down to earth. And so Kabir is speaking from that view of life, that there are subtle influences that we pick up without realizing it. Kirpal Singh comments on subtle influences and the need for becoming vegetarian. Regarding laxity in the prescribed diet, he says, I wish to teach all seekers on the path that it is necessary so long as one is in the physical body. Vegetarianism should be strictly adhered to. Any relaxation in the matter of diet would not only be a definite hindrance in meditation, but would unnecessarily contract karmic reaction. The real goal is to use every means possible to rise into full God consciousness. In his book Spiritual Elixir, Kirpal Singh also says it must be borne in mind that restriction to a pure vegetarian diet is of utmost necessity. Any transgression in this respect is liable to affect your spiritual progress adversely. Speaking of the history of humanity, Kirpal Singh said, Man, with the thought of common brotherhood, worked hard both for himself and for his pets. He tilled the land, grew fruits, and produced food both for himself, his bird friends, and his kine and oxen. But in the course of time he grew ease-loving, with the result that he first preyed upon the animals' milk and then upon their flesh as well. According to the moral, social, and spiritual codes of conduct, one must not interfere with the lives of any animal in God's creation. In India, this standard of living is enunciated as ahimsa, or non-injury to all living creatures. The sattvic foods and simple living are conducive to the development of higher culture or civilization. We must remember that food is made for man and not man for food. Eat to live and not live to eat should be our maxim in life. By following this course, we create receptivity for higher things in life, ethical and spiritual, leading gradually to self-knowledge and God knowledge. A passage from the book The Wheel of Life and the Mystery of Death by Kirpal Singh. A Western master of sound and light by the name of Pythagoras once said, Our earth has abundance of such pure and harmless foods, and there is no need for us to partake of meals for which blood has to be shed and innocent life sacrificed. This is titled Diet and Spirituality by Donna Kelly from a publication called Lotus Leaves. When one enters the spiritual life of Santmat, the path of the masters, he or she also takes upon himself or herself the discipline of becoming a vegetarian. 
This means abstaining from the eating of all animal flesh, meaning flesh, fish, and fowl, including eggs, together with any animal byproducts or derivatives. There are two basic reasons for this prohibition. First, the body, the temple of God, must be kept clean and vital. Secondly, karmic law plays a very definite and important part in the progress of the soul's internal progress. From the karmic standpoint, it is impossible to understand and evaluate all of the facts involved in a carnivorous diet until one has thoroughly purified himself and thus detached his thinking and feeling from the bondage of mind and matter which has for so long enveloped the soul, holding it to the wheel of rebirth. All masters tell us that there are more active tattvas or etheric life force in any animal than is present in any vegetable or fruit. Thus a vegetarian is eating fruits and vegetables, disturbs only one tattva, it is manifestly impossible to live on earth without disturbing or killing some form of life. The very air that we breathe swarms with microscopic life forms which we inhale with every breath. This planet exists by one form of life destroying another. Is it any wonder that there is no peace on earth? Therefore the masters tell us to subsist by using that food which involves the least destruction of life. The experts say that most fruits and vegetables consists that most fruits and vegetables consist of about 95% water. Again, no pain is involved in eating vegetables or fruits while the animal cries out in agony when its life is taken. The small amount of karma that is involved in eating vegetables may be worked off easily through meditation. More from this article by Donna Kelly after this break. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Spiritual Awakening Radio, this week focused on the path of the masters and the vegetarian and vegan diet. The final paragraph from this article by Donna Kelly from the publication Lotus Leaves on Diet and Spirituality is as follows. Apart from the practical health factors involved in one's diet, it must also be considered that God resides in this human temple. It follows then that a coarse diet produces a coarse nature, while a refined vegetarian diet purifies both body and mind, making the temple a fit dwelling place for the indwelling spirit. I was very curious about Swami Sant Seviji, my initiating and primary Sant Mat guru. He grew up in Bihar district, India, in a world of Jainism. So I became very curious about Jainism, the teachings of Lord Mahavira, and eventually discovered the vegan Jains and their take on things. Jainism has a lot of ethical wisdom to offer and are very much advocating non-injury to living beings. A Jain Sutra says as follows, Non-injury to all living beings is the only religion. It is the quintessence of wisdom not to kill anything. All breathing, existing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain nor treated with violence nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. This is the pure and unchangeable law. 
Therefore cease to injure living things. All living things love their life, desire pleasure, and do not like pain. They dislike any injury to themselves. Everybody is desirous of life, and to every being his life is very dear. One of the great vegetarian passages of Jainism. Nowadays, many Jains are going completely vegan, giving up dairy, in order to truly and fully adhere to their ethical precepts. The following is excerpted from a document published by the vegan Jains called My Visit to a Dairy Farm, published by Pravin K. Shaw, who's been a guest on this program before. He is part of the Jaina Education Committee, the E. Jane Library, and the Jane Study Center. I visited a dairy farm located on Route 2 north of Burlington, Vermont, USA, in May of 1995. The dairy owns approximately 150 cows. All of its milk production is used to make ice cream. Here is the summary of what I saw and learned. It was milking time, 5 a.m., and the cows were being milked in three and a half minutes each by a machine. This is done without regard to how hard it is on the cow. It was extremely difficult to watch the cow's sufferings during the milking. The machine has no feeling. To extract the last drop of milk, sometimes traces of blood get mixed with the milk. Since cows produce the most milk after pregnancy, they are kept pregnant for their entire life, their entire fertile life through artificial insemination. Every morning, hormones or drugs are injected into the cows. They are also fed a diet geared toward high production of milk. The dairy cow produces about eight times the amount of milk a cow on the traditional family farm produces. The gestation period of a cow is nine months, the same as human. If a male calf of no use to the dairy industry is born, he is shipped to the veal industry within two or three days of birth. The evening I was there, the farm was shipping three baby calves in a truck to a veal factory. The mother cows were crying when their babies were separated from them. I cannot forget the scene and can still hear the cries of the mother cows. The veal industry is the most cruel meat industry in the world. It produces very tender meat that is considered a delicacy. The baby calves are raised in darkness in a very confining crate which allows practically no movements. They are fed an iron deficient diet. This way the meat gets very tender and textured they slaughter the baby calves after six months. There is much literature available about cruelty in the veal industry. Within two months of delivery, the cows are impregnated again. I did not have the stamina to watch the process of artificial insemination that the farm was showing off. About four to five times a year, this farm would take the cows outside for a walk. Otherwise, the cows are tied in one place, and they have no choice but to defecate where they are confined. It badly stunk when I was there. The farm would wash the confinement areas once or twice a day, and the remaining times the cows would live in their own waste. The life expectancy of cows is about 15 to 20 years. However, after about four to five years, their milk production capacity drops significantly, so these cows are sent to the slaughterhouse for cheap meat, which is used in fast food restaurants, hot dog filler, dog and cat food, and a variety of other foodstuffs. The rest of the body material, or byproducts, turns up in the products like floor wax, pet food, medicines, insulin, gelatin, footwear, upholstery, taco filling, cosmetics, candles, and soaps, unquote. An excerpt from the article on, reali on the reality of dairy cruelty, the final destination of dairy cows is the slaughterhouse. 
my visit to a dairy farm, a document produced by the Vegan Janes, suggesting that veganism is the way, that it's almost more unethical to eat dairy products than meat, because the meat is slaughtered immediately, where, whereas the dairy cows are tortured for four or five years and then sent to the same slaughterhouse. Thanks for joining me today on Spiritual Awakening Radio, exploring vegetarianism, veganism, and the path of the masters.